Today we're going to look at a pretty classic problem, and that is to determine all continuous real valued functions, where if you compose this function with itself three times, you get back to the identity. And before we get started, I'd like to look at a couple of tweaks of this problem. The first is, well, what are some continuous functions where if you just compose themselves twice, you get back to the identity? Well, there are tons of those. Maybe the most obvious one to look at is this family defined by g of x equals capital A minus x. And note that if you compose that with itself, you pretty clearly get back to the identity function. In other words, you get x. And this is true for all real values a. So there, in the case of a twofold composition, we've got a clear infinite family. And now I'd also like to show that we've got a nice infinite family in the threefold composition case as well if you loosen the need for this thing to be continuous at all real numbers. And we're going to construct this example by defining the function f of x, which is x plus a over x plus b. So let's notice what the twofold composition is first, and then we'll calculate that threefold composition. So f composed with f of x, well, that's going to be f with this x plus a over x plus b inside. But let's see, that's going to be x plus a over x plus b plus a over x plus a over x plus b plus b. Just by, you know, the standard way that we compose functions. Okay, so now let's take the numerator and the denominator here and multiply by x plus b. So that we're like canceling the denominator in both the numerator and the denominator. Okay, so what is that gonna give us? Well, now we'll have f composed with f of x is equal to, let's see, it'll be x plus a and then plus ax plus a b. So that's what's happening in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we'll have, let's see, x plus a, and then plus bx plus b squared. But now let's maybe simplify that a little bit. And we'll note that we get a plus 1 times x, and then plus a times b plus 1. I think that's maybe the best way to write that numerator. And then for the denominator, what do we have? Where well, we're gonna have b plus one times x, and then plus b squared plus a. Okay, nice. And now I'd like to immediately point out that it's most definitely possible to tweak the values of a and b so that this is already the identity function. I'm not going to do that here, but that would maybe give you another infinite family of things that are, well, that twofold composed to the identity. In other words, they're so-called involutions. Okay, so now let's calculate the threefold composition. So f composed with f composed with f of x. So let's see, that means we're gonna need to put this object that I'm uh, squaring in brown inside of the function f of x, which is up here. So let's see, we'll have a plus one times x plus a times b plus one over b plus one times x plus b squared plus a. And then we have to add a to all of that. So that's simply the numerator. And then for the denominator, we'll have a plus one times x plus a. I'm gonna write this as a, b plus a. I think that's maybe a better way to write it, given the fact that we can't factor anything out of that constant in the denominator. Then in the denominator, we still have this b plus one times x plus b squared plus a. And here we have to add b. Okay, great. And now we're going to take the numerator, which I'll put in these uh, yellow brackets, and the denominator, which I'll put in these red brackets, and we're going to multiply by, 
Well, this denominator object that we see in both setups, which I'm squaring over here in green, this b plus one times x plus b squared plus a. a times b plus one squared. So let's see, that's gonna give us a plus one times x plus a b plus a plus, now multiplying through to this a term will give us Let's see, it'll be a times a plus one times x, and then uh, plus a squared times b plus one. Okay, so that's what the numerator looks like at the moment. And then what does the denominator look like? Well, we're gonna have this a plus one times x plus a b plus a, and then plus in this case, we have to multiply this denominator by b. So that's gonna give us b times b plus one times x, and then plus b times b squared plus a. Okay, great. And now let's bring that equation for the threefold composition maybe to a clean board and see what we get. Okay, so now bringing our calculation from the last board and then doing it a little bit of simplification, we end up with the following expression. So the threefold composition is equal to this object, which is still a rational function. And notice that we will have this equal to x in the following case. And this will give us like an infinite family of solutions, like I said before, but I'm not gonna do a ton of simplification to this as that's not our main goal. So what we need is the coefficient of x in the denominator to be zero, but notice that'll give us the constant in the numerator equals zero as well. So check it out. If we have b squared plus a plus b plus one equals zero, then that means that's, this thing is gonna collapse to only the stuff that I'm boxing in orange. So the coefficient of x in the numerator and the constant in the denominator. And so that means for this to be equal to x, we'll need the quotient of those two numbers to be equal to one. So that means ab plus 2a plus one over b cubed plus 2ab plus a must be equal to one. So that gives you this like system of equations that you can use to solve for a and b, but I think it's like kind of not worth it. Like I said, because that's not our main goal. Okay, so now let's move in to finding all of the continuous solutions to this equation. So we'll move towards our main result with the following fact, which I won't prove. And that is if f is continuous and invertible, then that means it's continuous and bijective, but that means it's strictly increasing or decreasing. Okay, so let's start by showing that f must be increasing in this case. So we'll prove this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, suppose that f is decreasing and we'll see that we end up with a problem here. So if f is decreasing, that means if a is less than b, then f of a is bigger than f of b. So that's the definition of a decreasing function. But now we can apply f to this again. So f of f of a will be less than f of f of b. Because again, f is decreasing, so it switches the inequality. But now let's apply f one more time. So we have f of f of f of a must be bigger than f of f of f of b. Again, we swap that inequality. But since the threefold composition is supposed to be the identity, that means we have a over here and we have b over here. But then reading off the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we have a is bigger than b. But let's see what we see here. We see that if f is decreasing, then a being less than b implies that a is greater than b. But that's a clear contradiction, contradicting our assumption that f is decreasing, so that means f must be increasing. 
Okay, so now let's move on to the final result. Finally, we're gonna prove that the only solution to our equation is the most boring solution, the identity function itself. In other words, f of x must be x for all x in R. And we'll prove this again by way of contradiction. So let's suppose there exists some number that I'll call a inside of R, such that f of a is not equal to a. So that's gonna nominally branch into two cases, one of which we'll do, and then one I'll leave as a homework exercise because it's pretty similar. So let's maybe look at the case when f of a is bigger than a, but then the other case is the case when f of a is less than a. So I'll box this one, this is the one that we'll do, f of a bigger than a, and then this one right here, I'll leave as a homework exercise. Okay, nice. So now let's start, and I'll write this again, f of a is bigger than a, or maybe I'll like flip the inequality and say a is less than f of a. But now let's apply f to both sides, and since f is increasing, it'll maintain the direction of the inequality. So that means we have f of a is less than f of f of a. And then you can probably guess what we're gonna do. We're going to apply f one more time. And that's gonna leave us with f of f of a is less than, well, f of f of f of a, but that's just a again, because like I said before, or like we've been using throughout, the threefold composition is the identity function. Okay, so now let's put some of this stuff together. And by this stuff, I mean this inequality that a is less than f of a, and that it's bigger than f of f of a. So let's see where that leaves us with. We have f of f of a is less than a, which in turn is less than f of a. But that means a is between two values of the function f. But now we can apply the intermediate value theorem that you learn in like a calculus class. So by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a number t, which is on the interval from a to f of a. And usually when you're learning about the intermediate value theorem, it just says that this value t is between two numbers. But that being said, we know the ordering of these numbers. That's how we can do this. Um, interval here, because that's one of our assumptions. Okay, so t is on this interval such that f of t equals our number a. It's the number that achieves our intermediate value. That's why it's called the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so now let's put some of this stuff together. So notice that means that a is less than t. So that's sort of by assumption here. It's also less than f of a, but we're not gonna use that. Well, now let's apply f to both sides and we get f of a is less than f of t. But what's f of t? Well, we've assumed that it's equal to a. But let's see, let's like clear the middle and we see that f of a is less than a. So let's see, we assumed that a was less than f of a and that led us to see that a was actually bigger than f of a. But again, that's a clear contradiction, contradicting this assumption up here, or maybe right here, if you will, that it's possible for a to be less than f of a. So that combined with the small homework exercise, you'll see that what we really have is it's impossible for f of a to not be equal to a. In other words, f of x is the identity function. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.